Hey, what's up? Welcome to another exciting edition of Free Advice Friday. Looking forward to spending some time with you guys today on a Friday afternoon and answering some of your voiceover business and marketing questions as we uh, as we do on Friday afternoons. So uh, this is going to be fun as always. Thank you for joining. Thank you for popping in and asking questions and always being a part of it as well. So I want to start off by talking about some things about LinkedIn. I have been doing a lot of research. Obviously, I'm getting ready to teach my updated Making Money with LinkedIn Masterclass. That's going to happen next week. And I have learned a lot. Uh, generally speaking, you know, a couple of changes here and there over the course of the year. Uh, that kind of is, is the extent of it on LinkedIn. But there's been some big changes on the platform for 2024, some big changes on LinkedIn. Um, I think the thing that has been most interesting to me is there's stuff that I taught in making money with LinkedIn last year when I did the course in 2023, uh, some strategies that I taught for uh, increasing your organic reach, you know, getting some more comments, generating some more engagement. Those strategies that were very relevant and applicable last year, if you use those same strategies this year, they can actually work against you. They can actually get you punished by the algorithm. So uh, there's been changes to how profiles are going to work. There's been changes to the algorithm. There's been changes to content strategies on the platform. So there's a lot of stuff that is going to be changing on LinkedIn for 2024. So here's the deal. If you are not familiar with all of these changes, you're going to want to get yourself educated. Now, you can certainly go out and, and do all the research on this like I've been doing. I, at one point, I had like 14 different things open on my screen and I'm reading all these different articles and deciphering all of this information. Or, uh, you know, you can sign up for the masterclass and I will teach you everything that you need to know. And here's the other thing that's nice about these masterclasses. Once you sign up, this is probably the dumbest financial thing that I've ever done. Once you sign up for one of my masterclasses, you just always get the updates. So this will be the fourth or fifth time that I have completely overhauled making money with LinkedIn. For the people who signed up for the very first one, they've gotten every single one of those updates at no charge. So if you sign up for making money with LinkedIn this time around, you will continue to get access to all of the updates going forward. So I'm going to be teaching one on February 13th. That's going to happen at 1 p.m. Eastern time, February 13th, 1 p.m. Eastern time. So that is Tuesday. And then I'm also going to be teaching another one on February 15th. That one is going to happen at 7 p.m. Eastern. So both of these will be the same class, just different times to accommodate different people. Uh, so if either one of those works for you, uh, February 13th at 1 p.m. or February 15th at 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, if you do want to sign up, all you have to do is go to vopreneur.com, click on the store button, and there it is right there. You could choose whichever one you are most interested in. I'd also like to point out that if you are unable to attend live, do not worry. Sign up for the session. You are going to get access to a complete video recording, so you're not going to miss anything, but you're going to want to sign up. Things are changing on LinkedIn. Lots of changes happening on the platform, and you're going to need to know and understand how those changes uh, affect your strategy for the content that you create, the way that you engage with your network, the way that you build your network, uh, all of those different types of things, changes across the board. So we'll go through all of those in the masterclass. So for those of you that are jumping in on Free Advice Friday, welcome Mike, Dion, uh, TJ, Mark, Iris, Linda, Richard, Nick, Tracy, thanks for coming everyone. Uh, looking forward to spending some time with you today. You know how this works if you've been here before. If you have a question that you would like to ask and get answered, all you have to do is type that question into the comments. The only thing I would ask is put a Q beside that question as you uh, or before you start typing. Uh, and that way, it pops up a little bit easier for me on the screen because there's usually a lot of stuff going on in the chat window, and I want to make sure that I don't miss anything. So if you do have a question that you would like to have uh, asked and, and answered, this is it. This is your access. When I do Free Advice Friday, uh, it's basically the equivalent of a free coaching session, which, by the way, if you want to book a private coaching session with me, 150 bucks U.S. an hour, here you are getting $150 U.S. hour free, tons of value. All you got to do is ask your questions. So don't be shy. Uh, pop that into the comments. Looking forward to seeing what you guys want to talk about today. Uh, let's see. While well, wait for some questions to pop in, what else can I tell you about? Check out the new episode of the podcast. The brand new episode of the podcast came out yesterday, Demystifying Voiceover Contracts. Look, 
If you are going to be a successful VOpreneur, who is going to operate a successful and most importantly, a protected VO business, then you need to have at the very least a basic understanding of contracts. And so in this episode that I did with Lynn Norris, who is a voice actor, and her sister Karen White, who is an attorney, uh, they walk through all of the basic foundational stuff that we need to be understanding about contracts. We talk about protecting ourselves from AI. We talk about protecting ourselves from different usages. We talk about non-disclosure agreements. We, we cover it all uh, in the span of that one-hour interview. So make sure that you check that one out. That, of course, is available at veopreneur.com. Wherever you enjoy listening to podcasts or right here on the YouTube channel, you can watch that interview as well. So uh, definitely go back and check that one out. Uh, it was a great, a great interview and, and tons of information shared in that one. Mike says, what is your best advice on marketing yourself through video social media? Um, my best advice for marketing with social media, I'm just going to blanket answer this one, okay? So uh, and it, this could be... This could work on any platform. So this advice could work on Twitter. It could work on, sorry, this advice could work on X. This advice could work on LinkedIn. It could work on YouTube. It could work on any of the social media platforms. And it could work whether we're talking about video or we're talking about text or we're talking about images or whatever. Success on any of these social media platforms really comes down to consistency. At the end of the day, it just comes down to consistency. Yeah, the content has to be good. Does it need to be Hollywood production content? Absolutely not. It needs to be good content, entertaining content, engaging content, whatever, informative content, motivational content. It needs to be content that tells a good story. It needs to be content that people relate to. So there's all of these different things that you can take into consideration, but the most important thing is that it needs to be consistent content. Repeat after me. It needs to be consistent content. If you show up on LinkedIn once a month, you are not going to build any traction on that platform. I don't care how amazing your content is. If you come to TikTok and you post a video once every few weeks, you are not going to gain ground on the platform. The algorithms are looking for consistency. The algorithms are looking for engagement. The algorithms are looking for dwell time, which is how long people are interacting with your content. And to get all of those things, you need to be consistent. So whatever you decide to do, whatever social media platform you decide to embrace, embrace it with consistency. Make sure that you are showing up every single day. Make sure that you are posting on a regular basis. Have a strategy and stick to that strategy. I would also add to that, you can't show up every day for a month and expect to have a million followers and massive success on social media. Talk to me after you've shown up every day for a year and then let me know what kind of momentum you're building. If you're familiar with the concept of compound interest, uh, this is how it works. This, it, it's, compound interest is obviously about wealth building. It's about you know saving your money and then your interest builds on top of interest, builds on top of interest. This is how Warren Buffett became a, a billionaire, right? Is through compound interest. But the, the concept of compound interest or of compounding is not exclusively limited to wealth building. It is, it is anything that we do. It's as you continue to do the thing, your results continue to grow. Uh, the best example I can give you from my own voiceover business, in, in uh, 2012, when I started my first year full-time, I made about 15,000 bucks. In my second year, I made over 30, close to 40,000 bucks. In my third year, I made over $75,000. And in my fourth year, I made over $100,000. So I went zero basically to, to six figures in four years, and that was compounding. How does that work in voiceover? Well. In year one, I had year one clients, but in year two, I had year one clients that carried over plus the new clients that I added in year two because of the fact that I was still continuing to do my marketing. In year three, I had my year one carryover, I had my year two carryover, and then I had the new clients that I added in year three. In year four, same thing. I had year one carryover, year two carryover, year three carryover, and I had all of the clients that I was adding in year four. And so that's compounding. 
it works with anything that you do and that includes social media. I'm gonna put a link in the chat here. It's a book, oh, I hit the wrong button. I do that every single time. Uh, hang on, I'm putting a link in the chat. It's a book that talks about this. It's a book that everybody should read. There you go, it's in the chat, check it out. It dives into the concept a little bit deeper for you, but uh, definitely a concept that you should uh, that you should understand. Is the new LinkedIn class already to view for previous subscribers? No, I know, Dennis, it will not be available to new subscribers until after I have had the opportunity to teach the class. So uh, either I will post a video recording either of Tuesday's session, at some point on Tuesday I'll post it, or um, Thursday's session, whichever session I end up doing and, and feeling the, the most confident about. But uh, if you have previously signed up for Making Money with LinkedIn, I will send you a note I'll send an email out to let you know that the new version of the class is available. And so then you will be able to access it then. Uh, Dwayne says, is the LinkedIn section of the marketing playbook updated for 2024? I will get to that after I get to the masterclass. So I've been doing all of the research right now and learning about all of the different changes so that I can update the masterclass. I will go back and, and evaluate those sections of playbook that need to be updated, the LinkedIn sections, and uh, that will get done at some point. All right, let's see. Mark says, for marketing emails, I'm using my own professional email address. Do production companies still look down on emails coming from Gmail or is it starting to get more accepted? You know, this is a really interesting question and I would love to tell you that there's scientific research behind this or, or actual hard data that's behind this. I don't know that I've ever seen any specific statistics on it, but what I can tell you is what I see from a research standpoint and consistently over and over and over again, the research says that having an email address at your domain just works better. And I think it really is a perception thing. Think about it. If somebody reaches out to you, let's say a plumber reaches out to you. I don't know. I pick a plumber. Just seems easy. But let's say that two plumbers, two plumbers reach out to you. And one of them is joe at joesplumbing.com. And one of them is joe at yahoo.com. Which one are you more likely to read the email from? Now, joe at yahoo.com might be the best plumber in the neighborhood. But there's a perception because of the Yahoo email address that maybe this guy's not legit or maybe this is spam or is this, you know, like, should I even click through on this or is this gonna be a phishing scheme or whatever? And so by having, you know, Joe at joesplumbing.com, it immediately adds a level of credibility and trust. Right or wrong, you know, it's judging a book by its cover basically, but it's how our brains work. So I still think for the, like, what is it even, like, it costs you, what, 10 bucks to get a domain? I don't even know. I haven't bought one in a while. But 5 or 10 bucks to get a domain, for the 5 or 10 bucks that it costs you to get the domain, it is absolutely worth it to put that kind of, of professional image forward. All right, guys, thanks for the questions. Keep them coming. By the way, uh, 43 of you watching on the live stream right now, but only 10 people have hit the thumbs up button so far. Come on now. Don't make me sad. Hit that thumbs up button. Of course, I always appreciate it when you like. Make sure you subscribe to the channel as well. That way you'll always get notified whenever I'm popping up and, and new videos are here. All right, Tanya says, regarding content and breaths, mixed messages out there. Some say to leave them in its natural. Is it true for all genres when submitting auditions? Uh, I mean, breathing is natural. So yes, what I think you have to watch out for is really excessive breath. So uh, if it's just like, if I'm just talking right now, in between sentences, you can hear me. There's just a little bit of breath that comes out in between sentences, as opposed to if I'm talking right now and I'm taking a big breath as I'm going between sentences, and every time I start a new thought or a paragraph, right? Those were the ones you got to go shrink those ones down. Um, but I would be curious to see. I, I think Uncle Roy was watching. I would be curious to know what uh, Uncle Roy's thoughts are on that uh, on that subject as well. But I would say you do not want to remove them completely, but you may want to just. Uh, shrink them down a little bit. Nick Davis says, I'm planning a live chat with an author. I narrated an RS project. One, struggling to find the best multi-stream for low budget. Two, LinkedIn says I do not have enough connections to go live. Um, there are some of the different platforms do have requirements for you to be able to go live. The one thing that I would suggest to you is 
Are you focused on a particular social network or expanding a particular social network? So let's use Free Advice Friday as an example. If I wanted to, I could send this stream out to LinkedIn, to Instagram, to Facebook, all the different platforms simultaneously. But my goal is to grow my YouTube channel. The end goal that I am trying to achieve is to grow my YouTube channel. So I want to drive the traffic to YouTube. So if I'm giving people the option to watch on all of those other different platforms, in theory, could I get more views? Sure. But does it serve my ultimate end goal of growing my YouTube channel if I'm giving people the option to watch anywhere? Now, maybe that's not how you're working right now. Maybe you just want eyeballs, and that's fine too. Um, when it comes to multi-streaming, there are a lot of different options that are out there, but I can tell you from my own experience that most of them are going to cost money, uh, and most of them are going to require high bandwidth as well. So you got to make sure you've got a really great internet connection. If you're too short on LinkedIn connections, then the answer to that is simply you got to make some more connections. You've got to sit down and start making some connections. So if it's authors that you're connecting with, find a bunch of authors on LinkedIn and send a bunch of connection requests and get however many you need in order to, to build your network. Because at this point, if you don't have a network on LinkedIn, who's going to watch your live stream? Because LinkedIn is going to push your live stream to your network first and primarily to your network. So if there's nobody there, if there is no network, then there's not there's a limited value to you to streaming it there. So a couple of things that I would say to think about. One, am I trying to grow a particular social media platform or do I want to focus on a particular social media platform? And maybe you just want to focus your attention to that stream in one place. Two, if you're just trying to get eyeballs, then you, know, you could look for a system like OBS, uh, which OBS is free. It's not the most user-friendly software, I'll tell you. That's one of the reasons why I don't use it. I ended up using uh, Ecamm Live. That's exclusive for Mac. I pay like 600 bucks a year for it in order to be able to do these free live streams, but it's worth it for me. Um, StreamYard is another service that allows you to do some multi-streaming, but again, there's, there's a monthly expense that is associated with that as well. All right, Andy says, I have been told not to leave out ant forums. In your opinion, are Clubhouse Discord important? Is having a membership with Chamber of Commerce worth $600 a year? Okay. Um, I think Discord can be a really valuable place if you're into gaming, characters, animation, that sort of thing, uh, particularly on the independent side. I think that's where a lot of people are hanging out, and you can certainly generate some options there. I think... There's value in any social media platform if you're going to use it consistently. I don't use Clubhouse. I signed up for it when it first came out. I checked it out and I just decided that it was not going to be the place for me and I didn't have time to devote to it. And I knew that if I didn't have time to devote to it the way that it, I would need to devote time to it, then it wasn't going to be worth it. So my whole thing is, would you rather divide your attention across eight different social media platforms so they're each of them are only getting like what I don't even know what does the math work out to on that 12% of your your attention or pick one or two platforms that you can just do really really amazing at so I think that's one thing to consider second part of your question is the chamber of commerce worth $600 a year the answer to that question is what are you willing to put into your chamber of commerce if you're going to sign up for the membership but then not show up to any of the events, then no, it's not worth $600 a year for you. If you're going to sign up for the membership and you're going to show up to every event and you're going to build relationships and you're going to get to know the business owners in your town, then what, you need one of them, two of them to hire you throughout the year in order to make it worth your while? So it's like anything else. You get out of it what you put into it. I know a lot of voice actors who have leveraged their local chamber of commerce to score opportunities and build relationships. And sometimes those relationships aren't first degree relationships. And what I mean by that is you can get connected with the business owners who are part of the chamber of commerce, but they may not even necessarily be the ones that hire you. It could be that as you get to know them and as you expand your network and as you build those relationships, they know people. And so they say, hey, I want to introduce you to so-and-so, or hey, I'm going to pass your information on to so-and-so. Those are second-degree connections. 
And that's where you start to grow your network exponentially. So I would say you get out of it what you put into it. All right, let's see. I'm looking for questions. If you do have a question, by the way, uh, feel free to type that question into the comments, and I will certainly do my best to answer as many questions as possible. Richard says, do you think it's worth paying for a P.O. box number? I think that if you want to keep your home address private, then certainly there's an advantage to having a P.O. box number. I think that if you are going to have clients that you want to be able to pay you by check, for example, and I do, I try to encourage, I still try to encourage clients to pay by check. There aren't a lot to do it anymore, but I still try to encourage it because it's the easiest way for me to keep the most of my money. Um, but then, you know, if you've got people that are sending you things through the mail and whatnot, then uh, certainly I think it can be worth the investment, particularly from a privacy standpoint. And that's what I have. I have a, I have a post office box. All right, guys, I want to tell you about uh, a new free download that I've got on the website right now. Yes, that's right. I said a free download. Testimonials can be one of your most valuable marketing tools. It's one thing for you to go out and say, I'm a voice actor and I do great voiceover work. It's another thing to have somebody who has paid you for voiceover work to say, yeah, actually, Mark is great and Mark does do great voiceover work. So I have put together a free resource. It's the Vopreneur Guide to Testimonials. It offers up about a dozen different considerations uh, for collecting testimonials and using those testimonials. And you can get that by going to the website, vopreneur.com forward slash testimonials, vopreneur.com forward slash testimonials. And again, that is a free download. Walter says, when marketing to small businesses, do you find they're more receptive in need of a specific type of VO? I list options plus link to my site, but do you think mentioning a specific type is uh, has more effect? I do think when you're marketing to small businesses that sometimes you have to get them to even think about how they could use you. My favorite example of that is with realtors. I can't tell you how many times I've reached out to a realtor who's doing virtual tour videos. They're already creating the video content, but they never thought about adding a narration to it. And so I suggest that to them and all of a sudden they're like, oh, okay, yeah, I never thought about doing that before. The same could be said for small businesses. Maybe they're already creating video content for their social media channels, but it never occurred to them that they could have somebody else to do the voiceover for them. Or maybe they're recording their own telephony system and on hold messaging because it never occurred to them that that was something that they could have somebody else do. And so I do think that that's something that you can include with your marketing. And I think, you know, going back to the earlier question about the Chamber of Commerce, Sometimes when you sign up for the Chamber of Commerce, you're given the opportunity to introduce your business or, you know, given 20 minutes to tell everybody about what you do. That would be a really great opportunity to outline some of the ways that you think that members of the Chamber could benefit from your voiceover services because maybe they never thought about it. Maybe there's a larger company that's creating employee training, but they've always just had the receptionist do it because they never even realized that there were people out there who narrate this stuff for a living. Right. So sometimes, yeah, you've, you've got to make the, the suggestion. All right, guys, hit that like button. When recording live sessions over Zoom, Skype, Teams, etc., what are your personal feelings, camera on or off? Generally speaking, I have my camera off. And the main reason for that is just because my booth is a little tight and I don't have a great camera angle that I am really happy with. And when I move my microphone in to be able to use my microphone, then it's like this. I look like this on the camera. And that's really awkward during a live stream because I, I've got this U87 hanging down right straight in front of my face. And that's just the logistics of my studio. So generally speaking, I have the camera turned off. Um, now... If we're having a little chat afterwards or something like that, you know, maybe I could pop out into my office and turn it on or whatever. But I can tell you that I have never had a client, to my knowledge, I've never had a client care one way or the other. They're more concerned with the audio. All right, let's see. After doing, <laughs> excuse me, 
After doing an audition for a potential client after they came to you first and don't hear anything, should you follow up with them or should you move on? I always like to follow up at least once. I think I got nothing to lose by by following up at least once. It's funny because if I tell a voice actor to follow up on an audition, the voice actor's initial instinct is I'm being annoying. But if I'm a producer hiring a voice actor and they submit an audition to me and they follow up with me, to me, that makes them seem more professional. It makes me feel like they're more on top of their business. Now, the exception to that would be if they explicitly state, don't contact us or we'll be in touch or if you're chosen, we'll reach out or something like that, right? So if they explicitly state that, then just let it go. But if they didn't, then there's nothing wrong with double checking to confirm, hey, just wanted to confirm you received the audio or you know, have you had an opportunity to listen to the audition? If the client wants to hear something else, I'm, I'm happy to record another cut or, or something like that. Good questions today, guys. Thank you for popping in and asking them. I'm compiling a list of potential leads for e-learning work, but not sure where to start. Do you recommend any strategy for prioritizing who you contact by size or location, et cetera? So the first place that I would be looking for is e-learning production companies. There are companies that that is what they do. And you can do that search on Google for e-learning production companies. You can find lists and directories and things of that nature. Uh, bespoke e-learning production is sometimes another term, and all, uh, another term that gets used. Uh, so, I mean, that would be the, that would be where I would start. That That is where I started uh, doing a search for those. Um, looking at websites like uh, the e-learning guild or the e-learning industry, uh, there's a couple other ones that I, I, I'm, I'm brain farting on off the top of my head, but they'll come up and, and they'll have directories often of companies that do that sort of production. Um, and so that would certainly be a place where you could pot potentially start. Dino says, I'm working on a new commercial demo. How can I get maximum exposure to new clients? You've got to send it to them. That's the answer, Dino. If you want to get maximum, if you want to get maximum exposure for your new demo, you've got to send it to as many people as humanly possible. That does not mean share it on Facebook, share it on Twitter, share it on LinkedIn. You can do those things, but that's not all you're going to be able to do. In order to get maximum exposure, you've got to find every person that you can find who does commercial work, every production company that is in the commercial space, and you've got to get them your demo so that they can listen to your demo. And when they have the opportunity to listen to your demo, if your demo is great, then your demo will do the selling for you. That's what you've got to do. You've got to make a plan for, I'm going to contact X number of people a day, and you've just got to start sending that demo to as many people as possible. All right, guys, hit that like button for me, please. Since we're talking about marketing specifically, who do I contact for e-learning? Who do I send my demo to for commercial? Uh, let me tell you about this resource that I created, 40 job titles to connect with for voiceover. I have over 6,000 people in my LinkedIn. Uh, I have over 4,000 people uh, sorry, 6,000 people in my CRM, over 4,000 people in my LinkedIn. And what I did was I went through those two databases and I compiled a list of the 40 most common job titles that I'm working with. And I put them into a guide. That is available if you go to vopreneur.com. You can go to vopreneur.com. If you uh, click on the store button, let me show you. Uh, click on the store button and here it is right here. 40 job titles. If you are not sure who to send your demo to, for 27 bucks, I'm gonna give you 40 of the most common job titles that I am working with in my own voiceover business. Job titles that are pulled, again, straight from my CRM and straight from my LinkedIn network. Uh, so you might wanna check that one out. Again, if you go to vopreneur.com forward slash store and you can get that 40 job titles guide. All right, where are we going? 
Do you think having credit card, debit card acceptance is a big plus instead of checks? Fees are 3% max in most cases. 100%, Andy. 100%. Understand that when you do voiceover, you want to get paid a fair rate because you're providing a, a valuable service, right? Which is reasonable. If you have public transportation in your town, when I need to go to Toronto to do a session in the studio, I pay for the train because it's a valuable service that makes sure that I'm going to get to the studio on time and I have no problem paying for the train. I want to get paid for my work and the service that I provide. The train wants to get paid for their work and the service they provide. Credit cards are no different. When you use a service like Stripe or Square or PayPal or Wave Apps or whatever it is, they're providing a service, a valuable service. It makes my clients' lives easier to be able to pay with credit card. And that is worth something to me. Not to mention the fact that it makes my life easier because the money gets deposited and the credit card company collects it, deposits it straight to my bank account. There's less for me to do on that end. So I do not sweat the credit card processing fees. If I can get a client to pay me via check, of course, I'm going to try to get them to pay me via check. If I can get a client to pay me via direct deposit, of course, I'm going to get them to pay me via direct deposit. And I do. I have clients that pay me via check. I have clients that pay me via direct deposit. But if a client wants to pay me by credit card and I want to get paid, I want to make it as easy as possible. So I do use PayPal, although I try to use it less because I'm not as big of a, I'm not as big of a fan of it. Uh, I use Stripe a ton. I have custom pages set up, uh, custom secure pages set up on my website where my European clients can pay in euros, my British clients can pay in pounds, my U.S. clients can pay in U.S. dollars, and all of that goes through uh, is processed through Stripe, and it is 100% worth it for me. And I can also tell you that my time to payment improved greatly. As soon as I started offering credit cards, that made a huge difference. Everybody's got a rewards card these days. Everybody wants to get rewards on their rewards card, right? We're all building travel miles for retirement or whatever. Uh, and so being able to offer that was huge. On that note of testimonials, what do you think about asking for referrals from clients? Do you have any advice on how to approach that or even tips for wording a request? I am a huge fan of referrals. I think that referrals are one of the most underutilized marketing tools in the voice actors toolbox because we're afraid to ask the question. When you do great work for a client, you should not be ashamed or fearful or embarrassed about asking for a testimonial. Just like the voiceover over community hangs out with each other, right? We all get, we're, you know, in a couple of weeks, we're all gonna be together at VO Atlanta. You know, there's gonna be a thousand of us running around. We hang out together on Facebook groups. We hang out together right here on Free Advice Friday. I think it's safe to say that that works in other industries as well. Instructional designers are hanging out with instructional designers and networking with instructional designers. Video producers are hanging out with video producers and networking with other video producers. So they know people. So if you do a really great job for a client and you send them a quick note and say, by the way, if you happen to know anybody in your network who might be looking for a voice actor or who could benefit from my services, I would be thrilled if you would be willing to pass my information along. And it can really be that simple. And that is how I've got jobs in the past because of those, those client referrals. So don't ever be afraid to ask for those referrals. All right, again, welcome to Free Advice Friday. If you do have a question that you would like to ask or get answered, feel free to type that into the comments. And I will certainly do my best to answer as many questions as I can here over the next uh, 26 minutes. Uh, I can stick around until two o'clock Eastern time. So feel free to type your question in the comments. Just put the Q before you type your question. The 40 job titles is awesome. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that, Richard. So there you go. If you uh, were thinking about that, now there's a, there's a testimonial. So thank you for that testimonial, Richard. I, I certainly appreciate that. I'm working on a new commercial demo. What are some good ways to share or post a demo to generate new clients? So let's say that you've got one commercial demo that's got six spots on it. What you have is seven social media posts. Do the math. You've got one post, which is your demo as a whole. But you could also create a post 
from each individual clip on your demo. So that one demo with six bots turns into seven different social media posts. So that would be the first thing that I would be looking at. I'm also going to give you another thing. Hang on, I gotta find the link. Here we go. I'm putting a link in the chat, keep an eye out for it. 12 tips for marketing your demo. This is another free guide, okay? I just threw it in the chat. Uh, 12 tips for marketing your voiceover demo. So you can go to vopreneur.com forward slash 12 demo tips. vopreneur.com forward slash 12 demo tips uh, and sign up for that free guide. And that is gonna give you some different strategies for how you can market your voiceover demo. So check that one out. All right, let's see. I apologize if I have missed your question. I'm trying to get to as many of them as possible. Austin says many small businesses don't have a message on hold system in place, so they can't upload MP3s. Do you have you don't any? Okay, I'm I'm not 100% sure where you're where you're going with that, but I will say I have done voiceover for small businesses in the past where they have given me their code passcode. I have called into the business after hours and recorded the greeting directly on their answering machine. So I have done that. I have also done voiceover for small businesses where I have sent them the MP3 and then they literally go like this. They take their phone and they hold it up to the speaker while they're playing it back. Like literally, that's how they do it and it works. Uh, so there are certainly workarounds for it. So I would say don't make that assumption. Just making that blanket assumption that a lot of small businesses don't have on hold systems, that just stopped you from marketing. That's the barrier that you just gave yourself so that now you're not going to do it. But if you reached out to 100 of those small businesses and two of them had phone systems and one of them hired you and you made $1,000 a year updating their phone system, was it worth it? $1,000 a year for updating their phone system once a month, by the way, not that's not crazy money. Like that's not, that's not a crazy ask. So keep that in mind. All right, let's see. <laughs> Does uh, YouTube li limit how many, how much you can put in the clients? I was curious. I, I don't know. I've never typed a long one before. Where do you invoice from for clients to pay? Uh, I am a big fan of wave apps, uh, waveapps.com. That is the website that I use waveapps.com. My accountant is the one that turned me on to it. I've been using it since 2017, maybe. Um, it's free. It's online. It's easy. It works great. Um, so that's what I'm doing. But I know there are other people that are using FreshBooks, QuickBooks, you know, some of those different options that are out there as well. Sorry, guys, just looking through, looking for questions here. Can you recommend a place to handle my taxes for my VO business? I want to keep it separate from my normal household taxes. I think when it comes to taxes, there is a misconception that you need to have a, a, an accountant that specifically does VO. And you don't. In fact, I, I don't even know if there are any. I mean, I'm sure there is somewhere. But I have an accountant who just understands small business. And so as long as you understand small business in your area, by the way, right? Because the, the things that I can claim, the write-offs that I can put through, those are obviously different here than they are in other places. That can vary from state to state, country to country, province to province, et cetera, et cetera. So I think if even if you have an accountant who is just familiar with doing small business in your jurisdiction, then you're probably going to be safe. And remember, guys, a good accountant will pay for themselves multiple times over through what they save you on your taxes. How would you go about creating video content for your demo or samples if you do not have any besides just a picture of you with the audio wave moving? Uh, man, that works. It really does. I, I would argue, and I, and I know that there are people who would argue this against me, but I would argue that in some instances, that static image with the wave file moving or whatever might actually be better because then they have to focus on the voice. If you've got a, a fully produced video that looks like a commercial, 
there's the the risk, at least, that they're going to get lost in the visuals and, and they're not going to pay as much attention to the read. So I think there could be a, an argument made for, you know, just using that that static image. I have created a lot of videos in the past using Canva and using f footage from Canva and even the editing capabilities of Canva. Um, so that that is certainly one of the places where I think that you could look. And I've used Headliner. Uh, Headliner.app uh, is the website. Let me just bring that up. Headliner is a great choice. Uh, you know, you can do a certain number of free videos on on Headliner, um, and it gives you those audiogram style things. And you know, you do a certain number of free videos. It, you can. Uh, it doesn't give you a lot of editing capabilities, but you could create a static image in Canva, use that as your background, upload it to Headliner. You know, upload your audio, get the little moving wave file or whatever. Uh, so it, it's a it's a it's an option. Right. And look, anything is better than nothing, which is what most of us have when we're starting out anyway. Right. So it's a place to start. Uh, so that's headliner.app uh, for those of you that are interested in checking that one out. All right. What else are we talking about? There is still a disproportionate number of likes to viewers. Show me the love, please. Please, please show me the love. Hit that like button for me. All right, let's see. Nimble versus HubSpot. Okay, this is a good question. Very good question. HubSpot offers a free CRM. And a lot of people like HubSpot because a lot of people like free. Keep in mind that their free CRM is a very basic CRM. It's basically a glorified contact manager. Now, where you have to be careful with HubSpot is when it comes time to upgrade. That is when you are going to get in trouble. So let me just pull this up. Now, keep in mind, I'm in Canada, so it's showing me Canadian prices. If you want to upgrade HubSpot to get access to a little bit more information or a few more bells and whistles. So I have 6,000 people in my CRM right now. So let me just change these numbers to 6,000. Oh, that one only lets me do 10,000. Uh, $1,332 a month Canadian. Okay. Let's just, for the fun of it, let's just go xe.com. Uh, so we're going to go 1,300. Just see Canadian, because I know most of you are watching in the States right now. So, okay, so $965 US, right? So we're talking almost $1,000 a month to upgrade. So what does that mean? If you sign up for HubSpot and you want to use the free CRM, the free CRM, and the free CRM is all you are ever going to need, then you will be fine. Sign up for HubSpot, use the free CRM, and great. If you are thinking that you might want to have access to more functionality down the road, then it might be in your best interest to start with a different CRM first. Because here's the other challenge. If you start out with HubSpot free and you build your database up to 1,000 people, because 1,000 is the limit, I believe, for the, for the free HubSpot. So you've built your database up to 1,000 people, but then you decide, I need a CRM that has more functionality but you don't want to spend $1,000 a month for HubSpot. So now you have to move your entire database over to another CRM system. That is a freaking nightmare. Now, all CRMs will allow you to export your database as a CSV file. All CRMs will allow you to import a database as a CSV file. So you'd think it's really easy to do. No, it's not really easy to do. Why? Because HubSpot doesn't use the same data fields as Close, doesn't use the same data fields as Nimble, doesn't use the same data fields as Salesforce. So when you export your CSV file from HubSpot and try to import it into Nimble, you now have to go through all 1,000 of those contacts individually to set up and uh all the different data fields that you want to use in order to get the maximum functionality out of Nimble. All of that to say, switching 
is a pain in the arse. So if you want to start out with Nimble first, give it a try first. Go to nimble.com forward slash Mark Scott VO. Okay, I'm going to put this in the chat. Nimble.com forward slash Mark Scott VO. That gives you the ability to sign up for a free 30-day trial, fully functioning trial, okay? Free, fully functioning trial. You can see all the different bells and whistles. You can get a sense of how it works. Then, if you decide, ultimately, that you want to subscribe, I think Nimble works out to around $20 a month or something, or $25 a month, maybe. Um, it's not crazy expensive. You know what? Let me look it up here, because now I'm going to question myself. Nimble, uh, where we go, pricing, okay? So there you go, $24.90 a month if you pay annually. That's not bad, right? And, and I say all the time, a good CRM should pay for itself. So on the Nimble versus HubSpot, that's, the, that's my line of thought behind it. It's a really good question, though. And by the way, can I just tell you, when I first started using a CRM, I had thousands of contacts already. And so I can speak directly to what a complete nightmare it is to, to import everybody into your CRM and go through that whole process because I did it. And so that's one of the other reasons why I say the sooner that you can start with a CRM, the better because you can build your database inside of the CRM as you grow, as opposed to bringing over a thousand contacts and then having to start from that point forward, which just sucks, okay? It just sucks. All right, let's see. Raymond says, using Apollo to market to producers, if there are several producers at a studio, do I put them all in stream simultaneously or just one or two and see what happens with them? I like to research all of my leads ahead of time. So if I find out that there are three or four producers at a company, I want to try to find out a little bit about each one of those producers. Because what if one of those producers only focuses on uh, print content or you know digital creative and one of them is focused on video? I don't want to send the wrong email to the wrong person. So I'm always trying to qualify my leads in some way. Often using LinkedIn is, is the easiest way to do that or using a staff or about page on a, on a company's website. So I do not default. If I see three or four people at a company, I do not default to adding them all in. I want to do my research on them first and figure out who the most right contact is. I pay $30 a month for Nimble. It's a great CRM though. I will say it works better if you remember to use it. That is a totally valid take, Vanessa. <laughs> yes, it is. That is a totally valid take most crms offer an import service even if they don't have a user accessible tools yeah and and a lot of them do like nimble gives you the ability to import a csv file the challenge that you run into is that the data fields from one crm to another are often not the same so if you import a csv file into nimble and there's a whole bunch of columns in that csv file that nimble doesn't know where to put them you either have to map them individually this is going to get technical but you have to tell the you have to tell the CRM where to put the data and sometimes that doesn't always work because different CRMs use different data fields and, and different data points and that's where it gets complicated uh, Lisa says what is a CRM uh, CRM is customer relationship management that's what it stands for customer relationship management it is a the easiest way to describe it is it's a database organizer so I can go into my CRM and I can see every lead prospect and client that I have in my voiceover business. And for my clients, I can see our entire history together, all of our conversations, all the notes that I've made about them, all of the projects that I've worked on with them. For my prospects, I can see where we're at in the relationship, the conversations that we've had. I can get reminders. It's time to get in touch with so-and-so again. I can set reminders, right? I email somebody and I get a an out of office vacation notice, I can set a reminder to reach out to them when they come back from vacation and ask them how their trip was. And so it's it, it's an extension of my brain, uh, but it is a database manager. What is gonna be on your smoker for the Super Bowl? Can I tell you something? I, I know nothing of the football. I know that's a shame. I know nothing of the football. Um, and in Canada, 
we don't get access to the U.S. commercials. And so you can't even say I watch it for the commercials because we don't get access to the U.S. commercials. Uh, so in, in all honesty, I, I'm assuming that means the Super Bowl is this weekend. I'm, that's so bad. Like, I didn't even know. Uh, so uh, it's entirely possible there will be something on the smoker. Um, it just probably will not have anything to do with the. Uh, with the Super Bowl. Is Taylor Swift going to win the Super Bowl this year? That's the only thing I know about football right now is, is Taylor Swift. Which, by the way, I don't know why everybody's got to be so grumpy about her. Given her position in life, if somebody offered you her money, her success, her network, who's really going to turn that down? Like, honestly, just give her credit for the incredible things that she's achieved. Seems like a much better way to live. All right. What details do you keep track of about clients and leads? Um, so for clients in particular, I like to I like to keep track of work history, uh, specifically rates. I think it's really helpful when a client reaches out to me for a quote to be able to just go back and see, okay, this is what I quoted them the last time. Or, you know, the last time we did a project of this style, this is what the rate was. And so I think that, that history is really helpful to have. Um, General notes on clients, right? Like if one of my clients also happens to be into smoking, that might be something that I might ask them about. Or if they happen to be a Red Sox fan or a baseball fan, right? Uh, you know, when spring training comes around, then I have a really good opportunity to reach out to them for a follow-up, not specifically about voiceover, but just to be like, hey, happy spring training or, or whatever. And so uh, just just little things like that that, uh, that I like to keep track of as well. Uh, and it's nice to have our, our conversation history because the reality is I can't remember everything that we talk about. And so it's nice to be able to go into my CRM and just see all of the past emails and, and, and very quickly kind of get that overview of, of where we are at in the, in the relationship cycle. All right, guys, once again, I just want to remind you, Making Money with LinkedIn, the masterclass, February 13th, one o'clock Eastern. This is about a two-hour masterclass, uh, time permitting. I will offer a little Q&A opportunity at the end of it as well. February 13th, that's Tuesday at 1 o'clock Eastern. Um, and then there is going to be another one that is going to happen on February 15th at 7 p.m. Eastern. So pick the time or the day that is that is most uh, conducive with your schedule. But also keep in mind that once you sign up, you will get access to a video recording and you will get access to future updates that are made to the course as well. So February 15th, 7 p.m. Eastern, that's Thursday, or February 13th, 1 p.m. Eastern, that is Tuesday. You can go to veopreneur.com. It's right here on the homepage at veopreneur.com. You can sign in from there uh, or sign up from there. You can also click on the store button and sign up from there as well. Uh, so many changes to LinkedIn for 2024 and really important changes that do impact the way that you use the platform. Changes that impact the way the algorithm works. Changes that that potentially will impact your content strategy. And so I want to be able to share all of those things with you. So if you are using LinkedIn or if you want to use LinkedIn or if you want to get better at using LinkedIn, head to veopreneur.com, get signed up for the masterclass, which is happening next week. What has been your strongest base of VO when you started non-broadcast like e-learning? Um, when I first was going full time, I felt like every project I did was an explainer video. Literally, I, I branded myself for a while as the explainer guy because everything that I was doing was explainer video. I would say now it's e-learning. And that is just because I really enjoy it. I, I actually really enjoy e-learning. I'm that guy that would rather sit down and watch a documentary than some, you know, random whatever comedy show or action series or something on Netflix. I'd rather watch a documentary and learn something. I'd rather watch a docu-series and, and learn something. And so e-learning is conducive to that for me. I, I love I, every time I every time I get to narrate a course, I feel like I'm getting paid to learn something. All right. When I repost an article, what credit needs to be given? I guess that depends entirely on where you're reposting it. But uh, Mike, if you're doing it on LinkedIn, for example, and you're actually clicking the repost button, then it's going to link. Let me say that again. If you're on LinkedIn and you hit the repost button, 
it is going to share the original post with the link there already, and so credit will be given. Um, if you're doing it on another form of social media, it never hurts to tag the original poster. In fact, it can actually work to your favor from an algorithm standpoint to tag the original poster. Uh, so keep that in mind as well. All right, let's see. If I missed your question, I certainly do apologize. For those of you who maybe jumped in a little bit later, uh, once the live stream is done, you'll be able to watch the replay on the YouTube channel. I will also go back and I will add chapter markers. So those will link you straight to different questions that were asked and answered. So you can jump around to, to specific parts of the video if you don't have the time or the desire to watch the whole thing. I certainly understand. Don't forget to get your testimonial guide. This is a free resource, okay? Uh, I'm gonna throw this link in the chat. It's on the screen as well, but I'm gonna throw the link in the chat. The Veopreneur Guide to Testimonials. It comes with uh, a dozen different tips for collecting testimonials and using those as part of your marketing strategy. So veopreneur.com forward slash testimonials. veopreneur.com forward slash testimonials. TJ says, what DAW do you use? Uh, I use Adobe Audition for everything. Um, I have been an Adobe Audition user for many, many, many years. Um, prior to it being Adobe Audition, once upon a time, it used to be Cool Edit, and I was using it when it was still Cool Edit. Uh, so that is that is my DAW of choice for everything that I do. Uh, E-learning, all the different genres of voiceover, podcast editing, everything uh, I do in uh, Adobe Audition. All right, guys, I got time for one more question. Have I missed any? Again, if I missed your question, I do apologize. I try to get to as many of them as I can. If I did miss it, feel free to share it again. Just scrolling through the comments here. Thanks for watching, guys. Holy man, lots of comments going on. 115 comments in the chat. This is why sometimes I miss. Uh, this is why sometimes I miss the occasional one. I'm looking to change to Audition. Excellent. Let me tell you right now, TJ. If you're going to do Adobe Audition, and I'm not going to say this just because he's watching, Uncle Roy does a two-hour life-changing Adobe Audition session. When I was used, started using Adobe Audition for voiceover. I thought that I knew Adobe Audition inside out and backwards because I had been using it for so many years. He taught me stuff that I did not have a clue about. So if you are thinking that you want to switch to Adobe Audition and you want to just be good at it out of the gate, you just want to build in proficiency right out of the gate, it is absolutely worth it to do that two-hour life-changing session with Uncle Roy. He's going to teach you the things that you need to know. He'll set you up with some different keyboard shortcuts that are going to make your life easier. Uh, it's it's absolutely worth it. So connect with him for that. How do you make yourself relevant and referable to the average person when you're in a niche or specialized genre such as e-learning or audiobooks? I think about my audience, right? When I'm when I'm sharing content or reaching out to people. I'm think if I'm reaching out to instructional designers, I'm thinking about what are some of the things that are relevant to instructional designers? What are some of the things that I can share with them? From the voiceover standpoint, I could talk about how I can help enhance their course. I could talk about how I can help them get ahead of their deadlines by being quick and turning around, you know, turning things around fast. I could talk about how I can miss their or make their lives easier by taking care of the narration so that they can just focus on the things that they have to do. So I'm looking at what are some of the problems that I can potentially solve for these people? The other side of that would be what's relevant to them. So one of my favorite examples is I'm a voice actor, but I'm also a small business owner, right? That's the whole concept of VOpreneur. So I'm a voice actor, but I'm also a small business owner. There are a lot of topics that are of interest to me as a small business owner that have nothing to do with voiceover learning new tips and tricks for productivity, for time management, uh, new apps or software or hardware that can help me to, to get better in my business or things that are gonna make my workflow better or help make my life easier, you know, things that I'm learning from the books that I'm reading or courses that I'm taking and stuff like that. And a lot of those things are universal. 
all those things that I'm learning don't just have to be applied to voiceover. They can be, of course, but they could also be adopted by a, a video producer who's running a small business as a production company. Or they could also be applied to an instructional designer who's working as a freelancer the same as I'm working as a freelancer. And so think about those things as well. Uh, it doesn't have to specifically be about voiceover to be relevant and, and to speak to uh, a potential audience. All right, everybody, I got to jump out because I got to get ready for another session. But thank you for joining me as always. Uh, let me check my calendar very quickly. Next week. It's February the 16th. I will try to get Free Advice Friday in. Our, I've got a few sessions already on my calendar for next Friday, so we'll see. But I will try to get Free Advice Friday in uh, next week, even if it maybe has to be a little bit shorter one. But I will certainly do my best. But uh, thank you for watching. As always, I absolutely appreciate it. Don't forget to check out the LinkedIn course at veopreneur.com. Uh, that is happening on Tuesday at 1 o'clock Eastern. And again, on Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern, I would love to have you a part of that and to be able to show you all of the changes that are happening on LinkedIn for 2024. Uh, thank you for watching. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for hanging out with me on a Friday afternoon. Uh, as always, whatever you decide to do this weekend, have fun, stay safe, and go find some leads.